Kia ora koutou. Welcome to this Te Pusiaki Manatanga Association of Educators Beyond the Classroom webinar, the 21st in our series of webinars, Harnessing Nature as Your Classroom, with the wonderful educators from Zealandia Eco Sanctuary. Ko Helen Lloyd Tokuingua, I'm one of the learning specialists here at the project team. As usual, we'll be recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel and on our website with guest faces blurred out so that people who can't make this live event can make use of this resource and watch it later. Um, we acknowledge that at the moment this is a very difficult time for our sector with organisations gradually finding out the results of their bids for funding from the Ministry. However, I'd like to ask that we park those conversations for the duration of this webinar today. As usual, if you have any questions for the presenters, please pop them in the chat and we'll come to them at the end of the presentation. So will we begin with our karakia and then I'll introduce our lovely speakers. He karakia tato. Fakatakati ho kiti uru, fakatakati ho kiti tonga, kia ma kina kina kiuta, kia ma tara tara kitai, e hi aki ana ti atakura, e tio, he huka, he ho hu, ti he mauriora. Well, I would really, I really warmly invite you to have a wonderful time with these two educators. I'm in, very excited that they're actually here in the room with me. I can I've given them away, give them away. Um, so we have the wonderful Melissa Gray and AJ Williams, who are rangers at Zealandia Eco Sanctuary. So AJ Williams is originally from Seattle. He's lived in Whanganui Atara since moving to Aotearoa. After spending years in politics in the US, AJ decided that moving to a new country was a good time to make a drastic career change. And now it really enjoys working in nature. Melissa has enjoyed a variety of work within park and community ranger roles, including events and environmental education focus in New Zealand, England and Scotland. She now looks after Nature at Your Place program and education bookings at Zealandia. So Melissa and AJ will share some insights into the way that they plan and deliver programs today. They'll do this by a mixture of using some pre-recorded video clips and some live discussion to um, a slide presentation. If you experience any delays while watching the videos, don't panic. Um, the sound will be fine. The video might be a bit glitchy, but they're very short and they're beautiful images, so they're definitely worth watching. Um, they're got to going to tell us about their novel program, Nature at Your Place. They're going to share some um, of their experiences of working in a world-leading conservation and education site. They're going to show us something about the way that they um, train staff and their protocols and share some of the resources that they have to support learners. Okay, I shall hand over. Fantastic, lovely to see everyone. So, uh, ko Melissa Tokoingawa. Kia ora, ko AJ Tokoingawa. Uh, so, this is Harnessing Nature as Your Classroom, and we'll start with our first video. Tena koto katoa, no mai haere mai ki te mara atane, ko AJ tine e tuaki nei. My name is AJ, and I've just warmly welcomed you to Zealandia te mara atane the garden of the god of the forest. I'm standing on the lower dam here inside the sanctuary, and we're about 10 minutes from the beehive in the capital city, which I think makes us a great example of an urban eco-sanctuary. Kia ora. and while filming our uh, previous segment, uh, we just noticed some chirping in the background, and what we've noticed is that there are three beautiful pateke chicks uh, that have been separated from their parents. And this is a really good example of 
having to talk about when you're teaching outdoors, whatever happens in front of you, whatever you happen to be seeing at the moment is, is a teaching moment. And we can talk about whether this is the circle of life or how beautiful and cute these chicks are, but also that they are animals. And we have an opportunity to talk with Tamariki or learners about uh, whatever, it, whatever their reaction might be to this wildlife encounter. It happens on the spot and you just have to go with it. Fantastic. So uh, you can consider us, I guess, an urban eco-sanctuary. Eco We're very close to Wellington Central, about 10, 15 minutes drive from the centre. It does mean we have um, easy access to many schools, uh, a lot of schools from the Hart Parirua, uh, Wellington, uh, relatively easy access to Zealandia. And a lot of people in the local area also benefit from the wildlife that uh, stretches throughout Wellington now. And Zealandia is a world leader in conservation. We're all very proud of that. It is the first, uh, world's first mammal exclusionary fence. Uh, we also say mammalian predator exclusionary fence. There's a lot of ways to describe that in a very scientific way. We wanna keep all the furry mammals out. Uh, 8.6 kilometers of that fence uh, creates 500 acres of conservation space. And for a visual of that, uh, it's about 250 football pitches. Uh, we haven't tried to mark those out in Zealandia. It's not part of the business plan, but uh, it's a good visualization. Uh, we have about 56 full-time employees, 123 uh, employees, which would be included in that uh, for part-time. And then we can service about 12,000 learners per year. And uh, during borders being open, we're able to have about 130,000 visitors come through. And uh, the thing that I didn't mention there as far as numbers go is we have a wonderful location right next to Karori, uh, which gets its name from Kaharori, uh, the Ridge of Many Bird Snares. And that community supports us very, very well we've got about 400 volunteers on an annual basis that do everything from feeding birds to uh, helping on night tours and everything else you can imagine, pulling weeds, and uh, we could not do it without them. So we have a document with Zealandia, Living with Nature, um, and just to see how we fit in with the picture, we connect, with pe we connect people with our unique natural heritage and inspire actions that transform how people live within with nature in our cities, towns, and beyond. And so that is our focus of live, of sitting in with education within Zealandia. Specifically in the education department, our goal is to provide an experience in nature that's educational and inspirational to the next generation. Uh, this fine young gentleman here that you see on the slide is um, someone that's been with us a very long time. Uh, he started out as a junior ranger, uh, has been at Zealandia for probably over a decade, longer than me, and is now uh, one of our casual educators. And so that is a really good example of um, inspiring someone when they're young and keeping them and, and benefiting from their service, uh, even as an employee later on. In general, we're talking about teaching outdoors and teaching outdoors fits perfectly with the research being done in Zealandia uh, on the health benefits of spending time in nature. And hopefully we'll get to share uh, one of those really great experiences that Melissa and I had uh, specifically in regards to the health benefits of being in nature. Uh, but it fits really well with all ages, whether they be Tamariki or all the way up to people who might be retired and have lots of time on their hands. Okay, staff and volunteers. Um, we've got a couple of lovely photos here showing one of our educators with a group. Um, so we do rely a lot on casual educators to help with our delivery with school groups, especially if we've got the larger size school groups coming through. Um, we also like to uh, give a shout out to our other staff and volunteers as well. On the right, we've got some of our lovely conservation rangers, and it's a great way of connecting uh, students or learners with what they could possibly do in the future, get them inspired by actions at Zealandia. So that might be office staff, it might be finance staff, or in this case, um, a bunch of very happy rangers that are a little bit muddy. 
Um, and so we do have a diverse education programs. Um, so we do sessions at night. We have sessions at the daytime during, during uh, through Zealandia, and we also visit schools. So we'd love to share a bit more information about our programs that we do. So I, Melissa and I do two similar jobs, but I mostly focus on what we call in the valley education sessions. And those range everywhere from ECE uh, all the way up to the secondary uh, achievement standards and curriculum that is um, quite advanced. We've got uh, Tokehe studies that we do where it's uh, a lot of internal classroom and then a lot of time out in the valley, um, which we're very fortunate to have to Tokehe uh, in, the, in the valley. And so they'll have a chance to observe those birds. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Uh, everything from plant and animal response to a stream study. I've uh, been lucky enough to be on a stream study with the school. Uh, it was a secondary group. They get into the stream, they test the water clarity, the speed of the water that's flowing, then they can go and uh, compare that to a stream that they might have in their own neck of the woods uh, that's outside of the sanctuary and compare the difference. And hopefully we're coming up with um, some good results in our stream because it is the headwaters of the Kaifatafata stream and it's a very important ecosystem that we focus on. And one of those programs is called Sanctuary to Sea, uh, which we're very proud of. Uh, when it gets to the primary, we start to uh, get into things like mini beasts. We do insects. Uh, we've got some really great insects here with us that we brought that we'll show you. Uh, we've got uh, citizen scientists or uh, pests and predators and special species. So they all have a theme and they're all co uh, connected to curriculum that's happening in the classroom, which makes it a lot easier for the, for the teachers. Uh, and so we, we just basically uh, would greet them on the bus and take over from the teachers and we bring them inside, we give them a health and safety briefing, we usually give them a little bit of a, a chi break, a little morning tea, and then we're going to uh, have a bit of a session to get them situated in the, in the valley, and then we'll split them up into small groups. Today we had 57 students, I think, uh, 57 learners and four educators, so we split them into smaller groups, and then they stay with that educator as they go through. Uh, they'll go out for about a 90 minute to two hour walk, and then they'll come back inside. We do a bit of a review, ask them what their favorite thing was, uh, talk to them about what they saw. Some groups see one thing, some groups, groups see another, and uh, just kind of cement some of that learning. Uh, and all of our sessions have learning outcomes that are connected to curriculum in the classroom. And that's a chance for us to also make sure that we've uh, connected all of those outcomes to the curriculum and make sure that what they saw is connected to the outcomes. Kia ora, here we are on the Tokehe lawn. The Tokehe are two advocacy birds uh, that were retired from the mating program. And it's a really great opportunity for our learners to get up and close with a very rare bird. And we also have all day sessions where learners will spend half of the day inside and quite a lot of the day outside as well. Here, making observations of the Takahe. Uh, when we're doing this, we talk to them about um, anthropomorphication. Uh, we, we want to enjoy the majesty of these birds. Sometimes they're cute with their mating behavior, whether it's preening or, um, or talking to each other with their soft calls. Uh, but then we ask them to get past that after they've had a chance to have that moment and start thinking about uh, what, what is the bird doing? Making observations, uh, maybe making a sketch, however they're inclined, making notes. And then um, we talk about why are they the way that they are? Why are they flightless? Why are they blue and green uh, and orange in only certain parts? And getting them to think like scientists. And the actual ability to be in the city and be near this very rare bird and be able to spend time with them with someone who can answer questions is an incredible opportunity for our learners and it's one of our um, showcase things that i think we do in our education department fantastic so we also offer outreach visits out to schools um, these this can sometimes be linked to the visit to the sanctuary if they want to extend their learning to the classroom 
or it can be a standalone sessions and can be quite helpful for groups that for one reason or another can't make a visit to Zealandia. Um, so we offer that within the local Wellington region. Um, so I guess you could look at it as if you were looking at bringing education outdoors, we actually sometimes bring nature learning indoors, as you can see on the right, um, or on the left, helping explore and understand more about nature or their environment within their school grounds or communities, as you can see on the left, uh, searching for mini beasts within the school grounds. Zealandia has some really cool stuff that we can do. Uh, because we are uh, so close to the city, it's pretty easy to get out uh, in the Nahidi at night. So we have night experiences. It can be uh, something as uh, quick and easy as a night walk. Uh, we'll get a lot of scout groups in doing that uh, or school groups from further away that might be staying the night anyway. Uh, we also have the ability to sleep over. Uh, the first question we get is, did we get to do that inside the sanctuary um, in the in the Nahidi? And the answer is no. Um, as much as I'd like to do that, so we're, we're in the visitor center. Uh, but it is an opportunity for them to go out at night and then turn around and go back in um, in the morning. And so they get a little bit of the twilight chorus and the dawn chorus. They can compare those two things. Uh, and then usually they'll have been inside Zealandia during the day and can compare that as well. Uh, you'll see that we will use red torches. This is one of those things that you would um, consider when working outdoors at night. For us, it's the consideration here is uh, that it's easier on the eyeballs of the wildlife. Uh, but as someone who works in the valley at night, I would say that the red torches are also good for your own night vision. Uh, and those are those little things that you would have to consider when you, if you were to teach outdoors at night. Uh, we also have the volunteers that come in and help us with that. So a trained person, we're going to talk about training later, but going out at night requires uh, a lot more uh, training and awareness of those people that are going to be doing that uh, for obvious reasons. And we're very lucky to be able to go out uh, in, at night in the valley. Um, so we also, also have funded programs, um, specifically at the moment, Nature at Your Place. Uh, this program came about before my time in the education program. Uh, the staff at the time uh, approached a philo philo philanthropic uh, group uh, through the connections that they had, and they came to them with an idea to see if we could get funding. They were successful with funding, um, so this is funded separately with a private funder. This, uh, this funding goes towards Nature at Your Place, which um, supports the program for decile one to six schools within the Re Wellington region. They originally started with just a few of the lower decile schools, but went up to decile six in the end when they realised there was still um, quite a need for those um, levels four, five, six as well. Um, and so this, this is one close to my heart, um, part of my lot, a lot of my work at the moment. It involves a combination of outreach visits to the school and a trip to Zealandia. The outreach visits, we don't have anything specific that we, any specific sessions that we plan, we custom them to the school according to what their bigger goals are. Um, this program works really well um, connected in with either an aim looking at a environmental project that they want to get kickstart, get started or um, get some extra support with or fits in well with a term or semester long project often involving the whole school um, and the program really creates opportunities for schools that otherwise could not have visited Zealandia um, and we do hear that uh, a bit from some of the schools that take part in this program they could not have simply um, experienced a place like Liz Zealandia without that extra funding that we've been able to provide. So when teaching outdoors I think the one thing that everyone would have to consider is the resources that are necessary to do so. Um, we're very lucky at Zealandia to have an indoor space. Uh, this is Te Tiri Tiri O Papatuanuku, the, the foyer in the lower left hand side there. Uh, what we do there is we, uh, and oh, and that translation of the name of our foyer that's been gifted to it is um, cultivating knowledge of, of nature. And that fits in perfectly with what we do in the education space. 
Uh, this is how we create a space uh, during the indoors. This is the first thing that they would see, the learners would see when they come in. You'll see a, a big screen TV with uh, which is touch screen. Uh, this morning it didn't work for me, so I had to go off the cuff and it actually turned out to be a little better than if it would have gone to planned and uh, had to kind of just go with the flow. It worked out great. We've got some cages there so we can store some backpacks uh, and chairs for adults and things like that. Just the, the basics of getting a space ready. But anytime you're doing education, as you know, you want to create a space so that uh, there's a sense of, of being and a sense of place wherever you're going to uh, be teaching. Uh, we've also got a really great opportunity with the freshwater uh, resource. Uh, the Kaifata Fata stream starts in Zealandia, and it is a really great way for uh, learners to get close to a, a very clean and a very natural uh, stream, which is uh, being protected uh, and can give them a sense of what it should be like, what it could be like, uh, and maybe how is it different from their uh, part of the woods. Uh, and then speaking of woods, uh, we've got a, a photo of a, of a nice open space with a bench. Um, that actually happens to be a cool photo that's being shot from inside one of the old mines in Zealandia. Uh, that's an, a, another defined space, which we'll talk about later, uh, but, a, but a clearing and then a space where you can uh, let learners explore a little bit. Uh, but the valley itself, um, the nature that we go out into is our best resource. I think our people could, could rival the valley itself because the, the education session is only as good as the people who are um, preparing for it and presenting it. Uh, but that is our best resource. If you have to go out and look for a place, um, if you're in Wellington, yeah, come on through to Zealandia because it's a great place to do teaching outdoors. And now over to Melissa to talk more about resources. Yes, we have a mix of resources um, that we use with groups, but also you can see on the left, um, we have resources on the website. A lot of the resources were created, I believe, in the first lockdown as well. Um, so we had more resources added at the time. Um, these are ones that families can use, anyone can access on the website, teachers, families, yourself as well. Um, I sometimes use some of these resources when building outreach programs as well. Um, so that's all available on our websites. We also brought, this is where we get to show you some of our bugs as well and other resources that we use. Um, and so this one here, some of the resources were here before our time as well. Um, we do have things like uh, the giant weta in resin. Um, if we turn around like that as well, you we can see the underneath as well. A good chance to see some species that um, students might not even have a chance to see, some will get to see. Um, it is also a chance to talk about them being Tonga species as well, um, just to be um, quite respectful, mindful when they are looking at them, that they are careful with those items. That one is a cave wetter we've got there. Um, and as you can imagine, we do get a lot of uh, different, re different uh, reactions from students as well but it can be quite a good chance for um, students to get comfortable with insects as well. Yeah, you can't forget about the, the, the evidence that you might have an animal around, which is um, poo, and all learners love poo, whether they want to get close to it or not. You might not be able to tell the sizing here, but these are about the size of a peanut M&M. And it is uh, cook straight giant wet the droppings. And so they play the role in our ecosystem much like a mouse would. And they actually have droppings that look like rats or mice, which are quite large. So if you can um, get a little bit dirty and, and, and touch and smell something that might not be something you'd normally go after, that's a good idea. Um, and especially going out to outreach when we are talking about these species, um, sometimes talking about what students can actually um, do themselves as well. Uh, many of us have heard of Weta Hotels, so this is just a small sample one which we can take out to students, um, open the door, kind of start a conversation about natural homes for Weta, but then also if there aren't enough spaces, if they want to create more homes for Weta, different ways of doing it. This is a small sample, but we can show them many different ways of creating these Weta Hotels. Can we do this one? 
This is one of my favorites because we uh, we like to talk about excluding mammalian predators. And when I ask people what this is, they say it's a pest before they'll say it's a stoat. Uh, this is a taxidermied stoat. Taxidermy is a wonderful way of introducing the concept of these animals that are very rarely seen but have a huge impact on the environment. They can very carefully stroke the stoat. Uh, I try to convince them that this animal uh, is not an evil animal, that it should be taken care of in a humane way. Uh, but uh, we do have to pick between um, introduced mammalian predators and uh, the, the precious uh, endemic species that uh, should be in the Nahiri. Uh, this is a great way of demonstrating uh, something that they might not have seen with their own eyes. And we just had a group in that was going to learn how to trap uh, and a lot of them had never seen a stoat, and I didn't think it would be good if the first time they saw what they had trapped was um, um, when they had opened the trap to see what was inside. So uh, a, a stoat that's been taxidermied uh, can be a really great way of introducing the concept of how beautiful this animal is. It just doesn't belong here in the um, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, also, uh, benefiting from the creativity of some of our casuals, we have kōwhai flour made here with a bit of belt, which didn't cost too much. And then we've got a beak here of tui. So you can use these in a number of different ways. I found these very cool for um, ECE groups as well. So we do um, outreach for ECE as well, but something that's very tactile, very... Um, yeah, very practical and speaks to the imagination of the students. Um, but we can talk about the shape of beaks and the food that um, birds eat and even going into uh, food chains and food webs as well with the different items we have. Yeah. Oh, you already did. Okay. okay. So uh, one of the questions that came up in the chat was the training of our casual educators. Uh, as, as you might know, there's a lot of competition for these people who are willing to work um, uh, an un indeterminate amount of uh, time each week, uh, but we do put a, a lot of investment in them. Uh, before they get started as an educator at Zealandia, they'll get two weeks of training. Uh, that's something that uh, I was fortunate enough to do this year, and we had a really great group of people come through from, uh, it might be people who were teachers in the UK that have just arrived in New Zealand, uh, to uni students, uh, to people uh, like the gentleman I told you about before who's uh, been around with us for over a decade. Uh, and so we've been very fortunate to have uh, some really great people uh, in, in our program. Uh, health and safety is key uh, for us when we're working. We're, we're always teaching outdoors or almost always. So health and safety plays a huge role in what we're teaching them, how to get those uh, learners um, through the valley safely is uh, our number one priority and then the education is uh is pretty obvious uh we we want to teach them all kinds of things to get them ready for what they're going to be doing some have ex, uh, experience working with children some of them don't some of them even have experience working with children outdoors and so that's when we start to encourage the peer learning uh sharing our stories with each other and getting to know each other and trust one another uh is a very important key thing that we do uh, te reo Māori uh, usage and pronunciation is very important that we model that uh, being done in a, in a, in a very uh, concentrated way. Uh, so we have people from Seattle, like myself, uh, people from the UK, and we all work together as a team to help each other on our journey uh, with pronunciation. We always give the Māori name first. Uh, I tell people at the beginning of my sessions or tours, whatever I happen to be doing, that uh, I don't practice the English name, so I might just forget that altogether. Uh, so luckily, I, I've learned over time that I need to tell people to prompt me for the English name. Uh, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying it's a it's a hole in what I do, and I forget sometimes that uh, people don't know what a kāreere is. Um, the content is very important as well. We have to know our stuff, and we have to be able to get it to connect to the learning outcomes. We have to know how the curriculum is situated in that. And that's a very important part of what the, the training is. Uh, so that's how they get onboarded. Then they'll do a little bit of following along, which we call shadowing. So they'll go out with an experienced educator. They get a chance to see someone in action. 
then they'll get to do what we call co-educate. So they'll get to share a session with someone as much as they want. Sometimes it's 50%, sometimes they just go for the whole thing, uh, but there's someone there to back them up so they don't feel like they're kind of out on their own. And then they're able to get signed off and get ready to go on their own. Uh, professional development is something that I've been lucky enough to be doing this year as well. And the session specific training is something for going to be doing Tokehe sessions, which are very specific knowledge base and, a, and the, it's very much connected to an achievement standard. That is something that we want to make sure that they're prepped for that session specifically. Uh, we, we do ongoing Te Reo Māori support. Uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, modeling that and we either do peer peer to peer. We have uh, people that we can bring in with uh, the experience that will help us, whether there be volunteers, I've uh, even been lucky enough to have a, a linguistics person come in and help us. And that's when I learned to roll my R's. Uh, it was the most amazing thing. So if you haven't uh, sought out some specific education in that realm, it's a really good idea. And uh, tips and tricks, uh, we'd never stop doing that. If every time we learn something in the Valley, we share it with each other. We build in paid time after the session to have a bit of a koreto about what are we, what did we learn today? Did you have anything challenging? Did you have anything interesting? Did you learn anything today? Uh, and sometimes that's just a chance to share what happened so that you can say, was it just me or did it seem like this was going on? And that's a really important part of what we do is the ongoing uh, improvement and professional development. Yeah, so tips and tricks. Um, if you haven't already watched it, Tally's uh, webinar from Mangatauteri covered this really well as well. So we've got a few um, of our favourite tips and tricks or ones that uh, particularly apply to Zealandia, I guess. Um, I think for my my thing, especially if you're coming from indoor education, um, being aware of people's comfort level in the outdoors um, will help their attention span. Things like making sure when you're stopping and talking to a group the sunshine is at their back and in your face so that they're not squinting and trying to see you um uh note remembering or knowing where all the rest points are ensuring that the people at the back of the group if there's anyone slower does have a chance to rest when you do stop as well um taking note of your pace through the through our valley for example um Temperature and exposure as well, um, particularly today when we had um, possible rain coming as well, just noting how everyone's going, is everyone still comfortable out in the temperature um, if it's a wet day um, and not being afraid to come back inside early and finish up indoors if you think that, uh, this, that will be benefit the learners more. Today was exciting in the Valley. Both <laughs> Melissa and I were out with uh, a group of 12 learners each and it was pretty nice most of the walk on the way back in lightning and thunder seemed like it was right on top of us uh and was there a little bit of rain yeah there was a little bit of rain puddles in the shoes kind of rain uh i'm going to talk about that later in a video uh, but we had some direct experience with it today if you're uh, around the wellington region you'll be familiar with what we're talking about but it was pretty soggy uh what i noticed is the Tamariki did not care uh, that it was raining. They were jumping in puddles. They enjoyed being uh, drenched and it was exciting for them. And I think that that was uh, a lesson for me to, to take a cue from them. Uh, we do want to, while teaching outdoors, it's an opportunity to, to uh, teach them to be kaitiaki. We want to respect the wildlife and the plants. We don't, we've got a picture of two of our uh, takehe. Uh, we've got Neo and Orbel there on the path uh, that we want to make sure we don't come between those two birds. They are a mating pair uh, and we don't want to stress them out unnecessarily. In the springtime, we usually have uh, Pu Tongi Tongi, which are our paradise shell ducks that each take a, a bit of a territory inside the valley. When they have chicks, they can be quite aggressive about uh, people coming near. And it's not necessarily that the bite is gonna hurt a lot, uh, but we wanted to try to in, um, encourage Tamadiki to think about the impact on those birds. If we get too close, mama has to chase us. She bites at our ankles. It's, it's kind of funny for some people, uh, but some of us see a stressed out mom that needs to be spending her energy on ducklings. So it's a good chance to encourage being kaitiaki. Uh, just general traffic, 
Uh, today we had four groups of about 12 each. Uh, so we have to make sure that we don't get in each other's way and um, that we give each other space. Uh, some places there's only one way in and one way out. So we just have to try to be as patient as possible. That's when plants come in. Love having plants uh, because they don't move. So you can always find one. Uh, kawa kawa or um, we might have korimiko. Uh, something that we can tell a story about while we're waiting for someone to, to uh, move along. Um, you might notice that I've got a quite loud and deep voice and I don't really have a lot of trouble projecting. It's a, it's a bit of a blessing working outdoors. My coworkers might disagree when we're indoors. Uh, so it's not as much of a problem for me, but um, uh, for me, it's mostly trying not to intimidate people with my voice, which is something that I have to consider. Um, so knowing our speed, knowing our, our voice, uh, knowing our, the wind direction, like Melissa was saying, the sun can matter. Uh, when it's raining, it's really loud on the hood. Uh, if someone has a hood on, we noticed that today. Very difficult to hear uh, if you've got a hood on and there's rain um, popping off on top. So uh, just being aware of those kinds of things. You're not really able to walk and talk. Uh, if the weather isn't perfect, uh, and some people might struggle with that in general. So just waiting for the group to catch up, get settled. Once they get their feet settled and they have they finish their small conversation they're having, you can start talking about what it is that you are looking at. And the biggest rule for us is talking about what's happening in front of us. We can't script it because we're outdoors and, and birds will come into uh, and, and rudely interrupt us while we're trying to talk about um, how lovely Tarata smells. But uh, that, that does happen and we have to go with it. And the more we practice, the better off we get. So it's about talking about what you see and then trying to connect it to the learning outcomes, which are then connected to the curriculum that's happening in the classroom. Here we are walking down Lake Road, our main path, and we're gonna stop off into a little bit of a clearing here where we've got some Tonga Towers and a nice defined space where we can let our learners explore. We can maybe have a moment to ask them to take a moment in the Nahiri to think about what they see, what they hear, what they smell, how they feel. They can take a seat they can explore a little bit in a defined area that we can set out pretty easily visually and let them have a moment here in the Nahiri to do their own thing for a little while. So health and safety, um, I'm sure that's uh, very important for all of us um, and pre-visit information, very, very important, much the same as indoor education sessions. Um, so many different ways to do this as well. Um, one way that we have done this, we have an online booking system for most of our sessions. So they will automatically receive the RAMS form and so forth. But as you can see up on the screen there, we've got some visual, fairly visual um, pre-visit information sheets. We have, have them dedicated for adult helpers, students, for teachers, for the organising teachers as well. So different levels of information. Um, and this will be available on the chat as well. Um, that, so you can have a little look at a couple of different ones that we offer. So we do give ones for different ones for night and day. Um, so a good old reminder about wearing the correct clothing and lots of different tips. But it's also great having those ones for students that they can hand out and give them to their parents as well. Um, going through the Valley educators, we carry backpacks with first aid kits, but we're also lucky in our environment to always have ranges at hand during the daylight opening hours. Um, so if we ever have first aid or emergencies, we can call up, call for backup. Um, and they can help assist and then we can still continue to create a good experience for the rest of the group as well um, whilst relying on someone else for um, some logistics there. Um, today as well this um, was can be quite useful if our group didn't have raincoats but if anyone forgets a raincoat and um, we have some spare raincoats that are available for learners as well.
So we've discussed health and safety, boundaries, things to, risks to think about when we're exploring the sanctuary together as a group. Um, every now and then it can be handy to revisit those, especially when we're going into new spaces. Uh, the reason I've stopped here is we're leaving the Takahe area, um, going into another area which has bridges. Um, it might require single file walking. Um, learners have been very careful about where they step um, lifting their feet up so it's a good chance to check in it's also an area that's really easy to stop the group make sure everyone's caught up um, and while you're doing that talk at Zelandia we often find um, once we've uh, talked about health and safety there's already another bird to talk about that has popped nearby So uh, we, you've noticed that we're in Wellington. If you haven't lived here or visited for uh, any number of weeks, uh, it can be quite variable. Uh, we've had a wonderful autumn this, this year. And today we had an incredibly uh, um, exciting day with the weather. Uh, if we if we went if we didn't go out during rain or wind, we probably wouldn't go out very often. So we we don't let that stop us. We do have management on hand that has very specific protocols about when they determine the, da the weather to be dangerous. Obviously, we don't go out when it's dangerous, but we do uh, tend to brave the elements. And it's just good, like Melissa was saying, to give as much prep as possible. Uh, don't assume that people realize that they're coming to uh, learn outdoors and that there might be some challenges with having jandals or tank tops or whatever it might be that they're wearing. Uh, and we have to, uh, luckily we've got quite a bit of resources that we can uh, lend out if need be. Uh, proper footwear is important for safety. We just want to make sure that everyone has a good solid grip on the ground uh, and less things that they have to think about. Uh, and so Today, we did get to experience some what I would consider hazardous weather. It started uh, when once we were on our way back, so we, did, we were already headed in and it didn't really affect whether we were going out or not, uh, but it was something that we had to think about. And uh, we've got a little video, just in case you think it's all sunshine and rainbows at Zealandia. Uh, there's, there's some proof that it's not. Kia ora. what a difference a week makes. You might notice a little different camera angle, quite a bit close up, sorry about that. Uh, don't have the camera crew in tow today. Uh, the weather has taken a bit of a turn, or one week from when we filmed our intro here on the dam, and it's about 40K winds. The rain is uh, pelting me in the eyeballs, and there's a thunder watch, a thunderstorm watch in the forecast. Uh, what's important about today is if it's not dangerous, we're going out and our attitude and how well we're prepared are probably going to make the difference. Uh, you've always got your rainproof jacket, rainproof shoes, uh, but a, a rainproof attitude is just as important. Uh, try to convince the Tamariki that, that the Nahiri is fun uh, either way. It's interesting either way, no matter what the weather is doing, we're going to go out and we're going to find some wildlife or something interesting to find to talk about. Uh, we might do that in a sheltered space. Uh, we do have to think about the wind when it kicks up like this. Right now I'm talking into the wind, but if I were to turn around and I were to talk uh, downwind, it would be quite a bit easier for the, for the learners to hear me uh, and for me to not feel like I have to overly project my voice. I'm a big person with a big voice. The wind doesn't necessarily bother me as much, but we do think about it when we're out here uh, and some people more than others, uh, but it's fun either way and uh, hope you feel the same way. And today the rainproof attitude held up pretty well, uh, it was, but it was tested, it was tested mightily. Uh, the, the key takeaways for today is that all of our sessions are curriculum linked and the heart of our learning is the actual sanctuary or in, if, you're, if you're teaching outside of the sanctuary, just being in nature. Uh, but the sanctuary is why they are coming to us uh, and it's what they want to learn about. And so that's why we're sharing uh, what we do with you today. Uh, the important thing is to have fun and, and endeavor to spark curiosity. Sometimes one of the best things we can do instead of talking to our learners is to ask them questions. Uh, what do you know about nature? What do you like about nature? Uh, what, what have you noticed today? Does, uh, does anybody have a favorite animal? 
uh, getting them to, uh, to talk about it from their own perspective, to spark that curiosity. And then once you get their curiosity going, you can stoke that spark and turn it into a, a, a flame that will burn on an eternity. That's a little poetry I came up with on the spot. Um, positive experience in nature is really our uh, biggest goal. Uh, what they learn, the facts that they learn, uh, is maybe uh, Im important in some ways, but them having a positive experience in nature, getting them to care about the nature itself, specific animals, and definitely the plants. We don't ever want to leave out the plants. Um, that positive experience can be even more valuable than, than the facts that they learn. Uh, we want them to go home uh, and, and talk about their experience at Zealandia in a positive way, talk about being outside in a positive way with their fano uh, while they're having their evening kai. And uh, if we've done that, we've done our job. Yeah, so uh, communication is key, um, both during, yeah, so both during during the event and afterwards, so we could do get feedback from the um, schools either through an iPad on the day or um, or I can send that through afterwards if we're a bit pushed for time. Um, and also finding communication before they visit. So having all the information um, on our online booking system and so forth. But um, having having plenty of conversations with the teachers if they have questions and so forth. Um, Matarongi, Matarongi Māori and bicultural approach is a key opportunity, um, very important in Aotearoa, um, and something that we need to, we will and uh, continue working on and improving on in that area as well. Um, and we are part of a learning ecosystem. Um, so we have particular skill sets we will work within those um, and share what we are really good at yeah and i don't know if you have anything to add to that aj well done no i don't okay Kristen. awesome thank you guys well that was just so amazing i don't know about you guys i know that some people have already put some thanks comments in the in the chat. I thought that was a really fantastic um, webinar. And I particularly enjoyed the mix of video and live presentation. And I really loved all these crazy critters and hands-on um, learning um, objects that you brought along with you. Um, Monica has just typed a question. What has been an especially rewarding experience in your work at Zealandia? Oh, this is this is the question I was hoping for. Uh, we, Melissa and I, as part was it part of Nature at Your Place? Yes. Uh, as part of Nature at Your Place, uh, we're very fortunate to be able to get to work with uh, some learners that have uh, been recently uh, experiencing a lot of challenges. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about their uh, their particular circumstances, but. Uh, when we went to visit them, it wasn't a traditional classroom. It was a little bit more um, uh, intense than that. Uh, and so we went out and got a chance to spend some time with them at their uh, facility. And then we uh, got to um, go back out again and take them outside around where they um, are located. And that was really great. Uh, and keeping in mind that these um, we, we, we didn't know a lot about these learners in particular, and it wasn't a traditional school environment. Uh, we did bring them to Zealandia. Uh, and when we, when we got out into nature at varying times, but every single uh, learner that I had with me uh, changed visibly as we were going through the valley. And I just kept thinking about the, the research that's going on in our eco sanctuary and other places about the health benefits of being in the um, in nature. And that was an experience uh, where we saw, um, you know, certain kinds of behaviors in one environment. And then in the nature, uh, these these uh, learners changed right before our eyes. And it was incredibly uh, rewarding to see that change and to hear the things that they were saying about being in nature and how much fun they were having. Uh, they tend to go on outings from their facility quite often, but to go into nature, it, um, it, you could tell that they had uh, changed their, 
state of being and it was incredibly rewarding and we also get these really great thank you cards uh which have um very cool uh drawings on them uh this one doesn't have any drawings it's mostly just words but uh we get little drawings of stick figured birds that say thank you in the little thought bubble and um, honestly that's one of my favorite parts Fantastic. do you want to add anything to that? yeah i guess yeah, another experience with nature at your place was just seeing not even necessarily about the learning um about nature a teacher was able to Found, it, found out they were able to connect with a student in a way that they hadn't before. They didn't know how to properly connect with this student, but experience with the student um, being comfortable in nature after I'd visited the school, they kind of got used to us as staff and then experiencing the outdoors in the area, the teacher and the student had a really great connection and the teacher obviously made the most of this experience and finding out that the student thought there was no great outdoor spaces near them, near their school. The teacher was like, right, we've got a task when we get home that we have some fantastic areas that we can access. We can share this with your family, give you tips to take your family on a walk on the weekend. Um, and it was fantastic to see and hear that, um, that it helps in the future connection. So it just gave them opportunity um, to see the student in a different environment apart from a school with, I guess, 30 students um, all inside just seeing the difference the um uh yeah the student is out in the outdoors well that's powerful yeah those those examples are so amazing really powerful stuff and yeah sort of direct evidence i suppose of the impact of well-being that nature can have um marlene asked er earlier i'm interested in how education staff work how do you schedule them in so you mentioned quite a lot about training but this is a sort of scheduling question so i don't know who wants to that. yeah so the scheduling um obviously with casuals there are some challenges um we do have a schedule a we basically offer um a look ahead for a few weeks um offer the shifts to casuals with them being casual staff members, they can say yes or no to the shifts. Um, and I obviously hope enough say yes to the shifts. We always have a backup of, especially during COVID times, I have been trying to keep myself as a backup. I don't schedule myself so much for the um, in-valley experiences. And I know that I've always got myself to um, do a last minute fill in for shifts. So we do um, yeah, send, send them out, but with casuals, they can just say no to shifts as well. But having a lot of good connections with and um, continuing communications with the educators really helps um, in ensuring that we do have enough staff um, continually on. And we're just very lucky. So <laughs> with the, with our educators, I think that answers the question. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I haven't noticed any more questions. So Monica, let me know if I've missed one. But I've, as usual, I've got questions of my own. So <laughs> please don't hold that against me okay so you mentioned about your funded programs which i was really interested in and, and i got the sense that those programs maybe go over a longer term than just one-off visits i just wonder if you could elaborate a bit more about how long that contact is or how how those pan out yeah yeah so with this one and nature at your place and um, the funding was granted for three years um and it requires regular feedback as well just to give um, the group enough information about um, how where our successes have been, how many engagements we have had with uh, students. Um, yeah, so it's gone. It went for three years, and then we were successful. We just had to apply, reapply for it to continue, and we were successful. Um, and luckily, this was above my <laughs> with our managers, so they had to work out the for the finer details of exactly what we'll offer in the numbers yeah so is that sorry to keep asking That's you about this is that um three years of contact with one particular school uh so this was um we didn't promise any particular school it's um for the first time it was for the first three years it was um engaging with 25 schools oh, okay. 50 students um at each school mm. um, and how and often it, you might you see the same students um so typically there's a typical thing of we do one eight outreach at the start um this is a really good introduction one for the students get them comfortable with where they're going as well and what they might be seeing um get their heads in um understanding na native species and that we aren't um a zoo 
um, that we, yeah, to kind of give them a bit of a background to that. Then they come and visit us, and then we do a follow up session. Um, depending on how how we've gone for the first two sessions, um, we can answer questions or help them start looking forward to what they could do on their school grounds. Um, but this is flexible as well, um, especially more flexible with our current one. We just need to count the number of engagements we have yeah. with students. So um, we can kind of adapt with each school and just make it work for them. I love the flexibility and range of your programs. You know, you've got ECE, you've got on-site programs that are both in classroom and outside, and you do outreach, and you do these mm -hmm. multi-visit programs. You've got so much going on in your offer. It's really fantastic. Um, Mal's comment, finding philanthropic backers is definitely an important avenue to think about, as well as sourcing varied or cost-effective resources from local community. Yeah, that's a good point, mm -hmm. Mal. Um, so I just want to say some of the things I enjoyed about your presentation. I love the rainproof attitude comment. I'm going to use that because I need that living in Wellington. Um, I really loved your the videos. It was really nice to feel that we were at your place. So that really kind of immersed us in your teaching environment. Um, and I really like the way that you use reflective practice so that you always reflect on how the session has gone and share that learning across the team. I think I'm sure that lots of us do that, but it's really nice to articulate that and let people know that that's what you're doing, constantly um, improving your your work. And something I'm going to pinch from you is the pictures on the health and safety. Because mm -hmm. the health and safety that um, I've been working on with my colleague at City Gallery before this job was all just words, and I am definitely going to steal that from you, so thank you. <laughs> Um, Monica says, I also really like your training and ongoing PLD. Yeah, that's awesome. Really fantastic. You obviously treat your casual staff really well. So thank you. So I don't think there's any more questions. Is there? Anyway, we've got another couple of minutes. No. Okay. So I just want to say thank you very much for your time today. I really enjoyed your presentation. It's, yeah, you've given us lots to think about and lots to take away and some great resources that we can post alongside your webinar on our website um, for people to refer back to. So thank you. Um, awesome. So before we end today, I just want to let you know about the next webinar that we've got coming up next week. So um, it's about manaakitanga. How can we set up safe and welcoming spaces when we're teaching about sensitive topics? So this leads on from previous webinars that we've had that relate to the new um, Aotearoa New Zealand histories um, content that's um, being added to the social sciences learning area of the curriculum. Um, and we'll be joined with educators from He Tohu in Pornaki, Wellington, and they'll be sharing their experience from the past five years of education educating um, around sensitive topics. Um, so it's on Thursday as usual, same time and 3.30, 4.30 and as ever we'll be recording that. So if you feel you want to watch it but you can't make the live event, don't panic, we'll be recording it and putting it on our website. Okay, so we'll end with our karakia. Unu hia, unu hia, unu hia ki te uru tapu nui. Kia wātia, kia mama, ti nāko, ti tīnana, ti wairua, i te aratakata. Koia rā i rongo, whakariria aki ki runga, kia tīna, tīna. Huie, tai kie. Thank you. Goodbye. See you next time. Take care. Mātiwa.